Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please click the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a crucial decision that any time series econometrician or any financial analyst involved with time series forecasting needs to make, that is, how many lags are appropriate for a particular time series model. And how on earth would you approach this problem after all? And today we're discussing two key techniques that can be used to select the optimal lag length. That are the Akaike Information Criterion, or AIC for short, and the Schwartz, or Bayesian Information Criterion, which is also shortened to BIC or SIC. And we'll apply those two information criteria to a simple autoregressive model of S&P 500 returns over the past 10 years. So here we have got S&P 500 index data. We'll calculate returns as usual, dividing prices today by prices yesterday and subtracting one, importing it throughout the whole sample. We'll need the constant for our matrix estimation of autoregressive models. So we'll just use a column of ones for this purpose. And for lags, we'll just refer to past values of S&P 500 returns. And for lags of higher orders, we would just refer to lags of prior lags, which is an, a very common and handy procedure to make it more efficient. So here, uh, there is a very important uh, nuance to mention. That is that if you are dealing with uh, a Kike information criterion implementation to determine the optimal lag length, we should truncate our data to reflect the maximum lag that we wish to consider. So here is the first subjective decision that we have to make. For example, if our maximum lag length is 10, then we have to estimate all of our models as if we have truncated 10 data points to accommodate for 10 lags, which is the largest amount of lags we allow. And 10 is an arbitrary number. Uh, here, you could go as high as 20 or as high as 30 or as low as 5, for example. But 10 is reasonable in the sense that it reflects two uh, trading weeks. Each week is five trading days, after all. Again, this is subjective, so in your implementation, you can go further up or further down. And the only thing that should be made in any implementation of the information criterion is that all of our autoregressive models we have to estimate on a truncated sample, meaning that we do not take into account the data over here that uh, are the 10 observations we removed to accommodate for 10 lags. And here we can estimate our uh, models coefficients for all 10 potential candidate autoregressive models. So we have got AR1 all the way to AR10. So for the first model, we'll just need to include the column of ones as our constant and uh, lags uh, of one day. So we'll need those two columns over here. So we'll use the matrix uh, function to extract the coefficients using M inverse of matrix multiplication of transposed X matrix. So we'll need to go up, include observations uh, from the start of the period where we have all lags available until the very end for those two columns. We'll need to lock both row and column on the top and just the row at the bottom. As we will drag this formula across and we'll need it to include further and further lags. So the X matrix would expand as we move naturally from an AR1 model to AR10 model. Then we multiply the transposed uh, matrix on the right by the non-transposed matrix that we can just copy and paste, closing the appropriate number of parentheses. And here we have got the xt uh, times x to the negative 1, which is the inverse matrix we use in the estimation. Then we can multiply it further on the right by the transposed matrix of x, which is available over here quite conveniently that you can just copy and paste once again. And finally, we multiply it further on the right by the vector of dependent variables, which is our non-lagged S&P 500 returns. 
So if we refer to this column uh, starting again from the same day. And here we need to lock both columns and rows. And we can enforce this formula using enter, and that would spell both coefficients of our AR1 model. And what is handy here is that if we drag it across, the coefficients for all models would appear in this particular matrix. And what we'll need to do finally is to fill the rest with zeros. So we can do forecasting and error calculations quite easily. That shouldn't take too much time to fill this matrix with zeros, and then we can calculate the errors for all the models using one formula as well. So here for the errors, we again need to calculate them only uh, from the day we have got all lags available. And here we can refer to the return that we observed. So this is the return that occurred on the SP500 uh, on the uh, 11th day of our observations. And we'll need to lock the column here as the observed return is the same no matter what model we use. And then we'll need to subtract the forecasted return for each and every of our models. Here we can uh, speed up our calculations by using a matrix multiplication function. And we'll multiply the row of our explanatory variables and the constant, locking the columns as well, because these variables do not change model to model. And multiply them on the column of our model parameters. And here we do need to keep the columns unlocked because as we drag it from model to model we want the parameters to change reflecting our uh, progression from AR1 to AR10 but we need to lock the rows as throughout the sample the coefficients do not change. And that is a very concise formula that allows us to calculate the error and we can drag it uh, to represent all 10 of our model errors and enforce it throughout the sample. That would give us the errors of each and every of the 10 autoregressive models in each of our sample days. So to calculate the standard error of the model, we need to take into account the number of observations and the degrees of freedom reduction, as well as obviously the errors themselves. To do that, we'll need to use the sum squared function referring to the array of errors from start to end. Then we'll need to adjust them by the sample size and the degrees of freedom reduction, dividing it by the number of observations, which is the same throughout all 10 models, minus the number of parameters used in each of the models. So for AR1, we use two parameters, one constant and one coefficient. For AR10, we use 11 coefficients, 10 uh, for the lagged returns and one constant remains in the model still. And finally, this is variance. To convert it into a standard error term, we can take the square root. And here, as we drag it across, we'll see how our error behaves if we include further and further lags into the model. It tends to drop. Uh, it does increase slightly when we move from the three lags to four lags because the degrees of freedom reduction impact on the error is higher than the increase in explanatory power by including the fourth lag. So we can see that naturally uh, the standard error of the model tends to go down as we include more and more factors into the model, more and more lags. However, sometimes, for example here, when we move from AR2 to AR3, standard error does go up by a bit simply because the impact of the degrees of freedom reduction is greater than the um, explanatory power of the third lag that we include here. And that means perhaps that the inclusion of the third lag is not that valuable for our autoregressive model. And the same can be said for the inclusion of the fifth lag. When we move from AR4 to AR5, the standard error goes up by a bit. And if we move up from AR9 to AR10, the standard error does also goes up by a bit. However, uh, generally, we explain more of the uh, returns of the SP500 as we include more lags. So that's good news for our autoregressive models overall. However, to compare these models on a level playing field, we need to calculate the log likelihood of each of them and then calculate the information criteria to justify whether these models have enough informational value, have enough explanatory power, given the number of factors they include. So to calculate the log likelihood, we can calculate it using the 
uh, probability density function of the standard normal distribution, plugging in the errors as well as the standard uh, deviations that we have just calculated. So here, to calculate the log likelihood, we can take the natural logarithm of the normal distribution function, where the x, the observed value, would be the error. The mean is zero, as all of our autoregressive models are estimated using OLS and hence are unbiased. And then we can include the standard error, which is the figure we have just calculated over here. And we'll log the row and not the column, because as it does stay the same throughout all of the observation days, however, it does evolve from model to model. And we need the probability density function, uh, not the cumulative distribution function, so we can input zero instead of one over here. And that allows us to calculate the log likelihood at a particular observation, so we can drag it across and down, and then the total log likelihood of the model can be calculated as the sum of the respective columns. So for the first model, for R1, that would be this column, and then we can drag it across to instantaneously calculate all 10 of our log likelihoods. Now we should talk about the uh, concept and the computational logic behind the two information criteria we examine. The Akaika information criterion is calculated as 2 times k, where k is the number of parameters that are included in the model, uh, constant, the constant is included there, minus 2 times the log likelihood of our model. And you want it to be as low as possible, because you want more explanatory power per parameter that you include. The Akaik information criterion is quite heavily based on information theory and on the uh, likelihood ratio test. Please check this video out if you're interested in likelihood ratio test implementations. However, it does condense uh, everything you want from the model in terms of number of parameters and explanatory power in one indicator. And that's why the Akaik information criterion has been so influential and has become so famous in econometrics and applied statistics. So let's calculate it for all of our 10 uh, autoregressive models. Two times the number of coefficients minus two times the log likelihood of each and every of the models. And you want this particular indicator to be as low as possible. It can be negative, and uh, uh, it's not a problem if it is negative, and it, it cannot be interpreted on its own, it needs to be interpreted relatively. You want to choose the model that has the lowest Akaike information criterion of them all. That gives you uh, the best return to your buck, where return is log likelihood, and your investment, your uh, input into the model is the amount of parameters you include. That allows to treat different models with different amounts of parameters uh, in a level playing field. And that's exactly why we have estimated all of them on the same sample, so truncated the samples of autoregressive models of lower orders, because this is when the Akaike information criterion is valid. For the Schwartz or Bayesian information criterion, we implement a higher penalty for the inclusion of an additional factor. Instead of uh, multiplying the number of parameters by two, we multiply the number of parameters by the natural logarithm of n, where n is the number of observations we've got in our sample. And Schwartz, when proposing the criterion, motivated it with Bayesian statistics. And Bayesian information criterion is uh, considered to be more conservative and uh, favoring models with less lags or with less explanatory variables in general. So it's no surprise if the Bayesian information criterion gives you a lower optimal number of lags than a Kaike. So here, for the Bayesian information criterion, we can implement the formula here, multiplying the number of coefficients by the natural logarithm of the number of observations, and subtract 2 times the log likelihood of the models. And finally, we need to implement the optimal lag length uh, search. So here we need to find the minimal value of the Akaike criterion and the minimal value of the Schwartz or Bayesian criterion and find which of the models does possess this optimal value. To do that it would be the easiest to use the match function, finding the lowest value across these 10 values. 
And here it would be easiest to use the match function, uh, finding this uh, lowest optimal value across these values, and we want an exact match. And for the Bayesian criterion, we can do exactly the same, finding this optimal value across these 10 values, and we do want an exact match. And here we're lucky, uh, as both criteria, the less conservative and the more conservative one, give us the optimal number of lags at 9. And we can quickly verify it visually, uh, seeing that, indeed, the AR9 model gives you the lowest value for both Akaike and Bayesian information criteria. That means that if you want to model uh, S&P 500 returns, you would need to use the autoregressive model with 9 lags. And that's all there is for Akaike and Bayesian information criteria and their use in selecting optimal lag length. This particular procedure is easily generalizable into any time series or even panel data model where you can calculate the log likelihood of competing models and you can estimate these models on the same sample. This is the only requirement pretty much that needs to be fulfilled for the criteria to work. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider the support on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.